Hi, uh, welcome to the Business Agility Live conversation with Game Changers. Uh, today we're here with uh, Kim Atherton, and I have my colleague Manoy Kana with me as well. Um, Kim is joining us today to talk about her experience scaling the unicorn organization quickly and adopting Agile on the fly. Kim joined Over Energy in 2012 when the team was 50 strong. As Chief Human Resource Officer, she oversaw the rapid scaling to 2,000 employees and was responsible for the organizational design, culture, and employee engagement. She built just three things to embed Agile at scale. This tool was, has made a huge difference, increasing transparency and innovation, and helping the organization move from 52nd to 20th in the Sunday Times Best Companies to Work For. Kim is now CEO and founder of Just Three Things, working with a wide variety of clients globally. Prior to OVO, Kim was a chartered occupational psychologist, consulted globally with organizations, including HSBC, Virgin Atlantic, and Novartis. Kim, thanks for joining us on the show. Let me start by asking you for a little background on your start with OVO. When you realized the company was going to grow so quickly, what were your thoughts or plan on how to manage this growth? Thank you so much for having me here today, Mick. So if I think back to joining OVO, um, it was a, a quite a tough decision for me because uh, I was, as you mentioned, a uh, occupational psychologist. Um, it, it looked like a typical career path for me would be to essentially go native with one of my clients um, and uh, do a, perhaps a head of talent role. And I actually had an offer uh, from one of the organizations you mentioned. And then I met uh, an entrepreneur who uh, essentially had a really big vision for decarbonizing um, uh, households in the UK. Um, and what I really liked about uh, the vision was not just uh, the end state, but how he wanted to get there. So he wanted to build a truly great place to work. Um, and really said, look, you can almost have a blank sheet of paper. Um, and I just thought I'm never going to have this opportunity again to be able to create and build an organization in the way that's best for the people that work there. Um, and so obviously joined uh, joined OVO. Um, and as you say, the team were about 50 strong. We were in uh, an air hangar um, in the, uh, the middle of the countryside in the UK. So uh, not quite uh, a tech uh, hub of any sort um, and yet I could see that the the passion and the vision for building a great company was there from the beginning which was really exciting. That's fantastic so when you realized that it was going to grow really quickly though how did you then manage to what did you think you know what am I over my depth there I, what, what, what went through your mind? It was certainly a we better hold on tight um, uh, mm -hmm. moment I think when I joined, I probably, so Ovo at the time were one of the only challenger brands um, in the energy space to the incumbents like British Gas and so forth. And I think that all of us realized that the, the models on which the larger energy companies were operating with were broken for customers. So for example, luring customers in with a, a cheap tariff and then behind the scenes, putting the prices right up and uh, therefore penalizing the people who are loyal to the company. We all knew that was broken. I think what we probably didn't know was that how big the appetite would be. Um, uh, and so we grew much more rapidly, I think, than uh, any of us realized. Um, and that was wonderful. It was fantastic. It was definitely a little bit hold on tight. Um, I used to describe this to my uh, HR and people team. You were on a really, really fast train hurtling down a mountain and we've got to lay the track at least one or two uh, rails ahead. Obviously, we don't want to go too far ahead because we don't know what the future might hold but we've just got to um uh we've got to start laying laying the track as quickly as we can um so that we can get on top of the growth um so in terms of, of, of what we considered um obviously hiring was one of the really big um uh pieces in this puzzle we wanted to make sure that we got the right people through the door um, and the kind of people we were looking for were those who could really grow and flex with the organization um, Ovo has changed 
entirely from the company that I joined. Um, they are now a uh, energy tech company. Um, they've acquired a, a large incumbent, SSE, so they're now 8,000 employees. Um, and the, the organization shape, size, capabilities, everything has changed. And so in the early days, we really had to hire the right people that could learn and flex and adapt to whatever the future might bring us. So we started hiring based on learning agility um, and uh, an attitude much more so than um, uh, previous experience with the idea that if we hired people who were adaptable and smart, then they could grow with us. And actually, previous experience might not be as relevant in the future anyway, um, uh, because we were going to flex and change and adapt. So hiring people was the big one of the big rails we had to get down as the train hurtled uh, hurtled down the mountain. Um, so we focused a lot on that. We also focused on what were the organisational capabilities that will ensure our uh, success as we grow, because I think as a startup. Um, things come quite naturally. So as an example, um, the ruthless focus on the vision and organizational goals, it just comes naturally to a startup because you're resource strapped and you have no choice. But as you grow, you have to really think about how to get that alignment and that focus um, and do that in a little bit more of a, a systemic way. So hiring people, focusing on the organizational capabilities that we needed to deliver. And then really focusing on um, ensuring that we were putting into place factors that would keep the people that we were hiring. And um, so things like empowering our teams. Um, we uh, launched an internal university and um, we did lots of work on uh, leadership skills because we all know that typically people um, don't leave a company. They leave their immediate boss and um, so we worked a lot about upskilling leaders as coaches um, uh, and really trying to make the environment um, as uh, as conducive to innovation and productivity as we could. When I hear this then I hear that there were a number of things that changed you know when you initially hit the ground with those 50 people there were a few things that changed along the way so assuming as presumably you were hiring for those previous skills when you started. And then you realized we need to do something different as you grew a little bit bigger. When What was the point where you realized that you needed to change the way you consider the people you hire for the future? Yeah, it's a great question. And we actually moved um, out of the countryside um, and to Bristol at the time, which was a university uh, town, because we, we, we realized that the future of the energy industry was likely to change um, significantly. So uh, at this time, I think you, know, you, you, you probably would never know, never meet somebody that owned an electric vehicle, for example. But a lot was being written about the future of electric vehicles and um, uh, and the big changes that were going to happen with consumer um, uh, behavior in that area. Um, another example, uh, at the time, the incumbent uh, energy providers really didn't have a very good online offer and um, but we knew that obviously consumer behavior was changing much more toward wanting to self-serve um uh, online so we kind of knew that the skill sets that we had in the organization to start with wouldn't be the skill sets that we would need in two years time and that we kind of realized that quite early on um, uh, and so therefore started hiring as i say for these agilities rather than past experience obviously we're a regulated industry and so there were some roles and um, compliance regulation etc that of course you needed experience um uh, in but for example uh for our contact center um employees we very much hired on agility um and then i guess one of the big turning points again was when we really truly started to realize that the future of our business was going to be essentially a technology business rather than a, 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 a I guess contact center based business um, and again that required a really big shift because we needed to start to recruit absolutely some uh, for experience but very very much again on agility and um, uh, learning agility and capability and um, a whole 
raft of software engineers. So we had to open a London office um, because we found it difficult to persuade them to come to Bristol. Um, uh, and we really had to uh, think about the, again, what do we need to put in place as an organization that mean these people um, can do their best work? So how how can we how can we try to um, uh, remove dependencies, for example, between teams to really empower our uh, cross-functional product teams to be able to do their best work? So it sounds like there were actually a few little pivots there. You know, as you started from the initial vision towards a second vision and a third vision. In fact, if I if I'm hearing correctly, so what were the most difficult things then about transforming the business? on not one but two different times to kind of build a company that was agile at scale? So we certainly made a lot of mistakes. Um, so it wasn't all just smooth. Um, uh, yeah, the train certainly almost came off the tracks a, a few times as it hurtled down the mountain. Um, I think one of the really big shifts, um, uh, and again, it wasn't a shift for us as an organization, but it was as we started to bring in more senior leaders and so forth. So. I think when we were a small startup, we we probably had a, a kind of a number of capabilities as an organization that allowed us to be successful. So I've mentioned that we were ruthlessly focused on goals because um, we had to be, uh, because we had a little resource. Um, and as we grew, we found that um, uh, that alignment to the key goals of the organization was Kind of fate, it was it was becoming more and more um, uh, misaligned, and we had lots of activity going on, lots of features, lots of um, uh, pieces of work, but we weren't necessarily linking those to the outcomes that we wanted to achieve. Um, so, uh, trying to ensure that we um, we ruthlessly linked what we were doing to the outcomes and started to reposition uh, any activity as hypotheses. Um, so obvious stuff, based on this insight, we believe that this feature will drive this behavior, which will lead to this out business outcome. And that was a real challenge because as I say, as we started to bring in uh, more senior leaders who weren't used to working in this way, um, trying to convince them to universally, not just in the product and tech teams, but to adopt this type of attitude across all of our uh, different functions and deliverables um, was very, was quite different from perhaps previous uh, experience. Um, to give you an example, uh, we uh, ended up putting loads and loads of work into launching broadband. So it was, it was based on good insight, i.e. customers who have more than one utility um, with a provider are more likely to stay with that provider for longer. So that's a great insight. But instead of looking at the cheapest way we could test that assumption um, uh, before committing more work, which was what we used to do when we were when we were tiny, we um, uh, ended up actually building a broadband business. So spending nine months um, recruiting the teams and setting up the licenses and then launched it and very quickly realized that the assumption that we based this on, i.e. our customers would want to build, buy broadband from us, wasn't there. And so we had to can that, that business entirely. So I think one of the challenges was we I think we realized some of those of us who were with the company from the beginning realized that this ruthless goal focus and then breaking down um, uh, what we were doing into the smallest possible chunks to test and learn was something that, of course, it's in the Agile manifesto, but way before any of us had heard of that, we were doing that naturally. And trying to, I think the challenge was, as we brought senior leadership in from different industries, trying to, um, uh, uh, I guess, embed that way of working um, uh, across lots of different functions was definitely a challenge. All right. That sounds very interesting and exciting, and I'm sure that it was keeping you quite busy, all of you, right? <laughs> yes. After my two small children. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's just try to get a little bit um, into more in depth uh, now that we are talking about agility of scale, business agility, and transformation, right? So maybe maybe a little bit of controversial questions, but not so much. Uh, but quite, it's a little bit, not much. <laughs> so as we see the complexity increases, right? And uh, with the expense of time and also the resources and the money as well. And uh, the the success rate is still quite low, 
you know, when we talk about transformations in general. So is it is it really worth doing a transformation? Or is it something, uh, you know, you need to tread that, that, uh, that path very carefully? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, with uh, Just Three Things uh, that Mick mentioned at the beginning, I'm now working with a really wide range of different um, organizations uh, who are typically going through agile transformation. So Just Three Things is just the software product. So we embed, um, uh, you know, focusing on key goals and um, aligning the activity behind those goals and um, positioning uh, features as experiments and, and obviously working cross-functionally. So we embed those behaviours, but we can't create them um, because we're software. Uh, and so I've seen a really wide range of, of uh, how Agile has been adopted. And I think typically the mistakes I see, um, and I'm not saying Ovo didn't do any of these, um, People or organizations think that the number of people they have trained in a particular agile methodology, be it safe or scrum or whatever it might be, is, is success. So they um, uh, they think that, OK, well, we've trained our 800 engineers and product uh, team in this new way of working. So therefore, tick, we are now agile. Um, and I think that's a, a really um, short sighted approach. Um, uh, because ultimately, the reason that you want to adopt Agile at scale is so that you can deliver better outcomes for your customers and the business. And I think sometimes we lose sight or organizations can lose sight of that and think we've just we trained everybody. This must be the right thing to do or we are now Agile. And then they wonder why they don't get the return on investment. Um, and the second thing I think is is the. Um, decoupling dependencies um certainly some of the uh, agile at scale methodologies um feel to me or can be implemented like waterfall uh under a different guise um so therefore uh really just breaking up long programs of work and delivering them in small chunks rather than delivering something delivering the smallest chunk working out if that made a difference to the outcome that you're trying to affect and only then deciding whether to invest more resource. So I think agile methodologies that um, require a really, really long planning lead time and don't allow the teams to get the customer insight quickly, essentially may as well be waterfall, which is could be controversial. Yeah, yeah. So why do you think agile isn't making any difference uh, or in bringing big impact to many organizations that it is promising? So I think some some of this is is no fault of uh, the organisation that there are just uh, it's very hard to decouple the dependencies. And um, so at Ovo, we were really lucky in that we because we were building the organisational design and the the tech and so forth from the ground up, we could try to avoid these kind of monolithic um, structures, be that tech or or uh, setting budgets by function or whatever it might be. We could avoid some of that. Whereas a lot of my clients, you really want to avoid it, but genuinely can't. So I think there's probably the either monolithic tech issues um, uh, that just really block the ability to empower the individual teams um, uh, to be able to release. And then I think there's probably a kind of, I guess, a cultural piece around um, uh, just the way that the governance of the organizations work. So how are the budgets set you know, if if you're setting budgets by function then it's really hard um uh, for cross-functional teams uh, to deliver against their outcomes because essentially it's a, a fight between the commercial org budget and then the engineering team's budget etc cetera, etc cetera, rather than focusing on what is the value we're creating together and setting that budget by uh, by by the value things like uh, centralized procurement centralized hiring all of those things that take away from the empowerment of the team and really slow it down um, uh, mean that really by no fault of, of the head of engineering or the, you know, the chief uh, product officer, it's really hard to truly empower and embed agile principles. Kim, um, I'd like to go back to the experiments you were doing. You said you, did, you did an experiment where you basically built a broadband industry, the whole unit over nine months that was kind of a large experiment wasn't it so when that was an example of where we got it wrong 
Um, uh, so apologies, I, I definitely meant that as a, as a we've got that wrong. Um, I think what what obviously what we should have done was to um, build the the smallest possible, the cheapest um, uh, possible way of testing the assumptions that we were going we were basing that decision on. Um, and I think uh, at the time um, it was an example of how it was bringing senior leaders in and. Uh, into into the business from different industries who perhaps weren't used to working in this way but at the time we probably and I'm trying to think back to sequence at the time we probably hadn't adopted official agile so we were, we had these principles in place just for the necessity of being a startup so if you are a bootstrapped resource strapped startup you genuinely can't commit huge amounts of resource so you have to check test your assumptions as as cheaply as you can and so the broadband example was probably just before we then started moving to um, uh, microservice teams and, uh, and agile in a more official way. Okay, so there was good learning in that as well to kind of minimize those experiments, test the waters as you go and see how you, see how you move forward. You mentioned as well about organizations, you know, training people and then assuming that they are agile moving forward. Again, we see that we've seen that in many organizations. I'm sure Manoy has seen that. I've seen it myself. Whereas people are left then with the, you've been trained, now go do it. But unless we change leadership, we have a problem, right? Completely, completely. I think um, the depressing reality of this is that um, any cultural transformation, be it agile or um, any anything else, it, it really is driven from the top. And... I think that we would all love to um, uh, to see a kind of bottom up groundswell, um, and I think all of us would uh, think that would be a really great, you know, more like a movement. But ultimately, culture change has got to come from the top. So, um, and the the underlying principles of what agile is all about threat directly threatens the sources of power for a lot of senior leaders. So, as a senior leader, the sources of power are typically the number of people you might have under your um, uh, jurisdiction and um, the size of your budget and um, the ability to set direction, etc. And moving from that to actually we're going to work cross functionally, we're going to empower teams, we're going to uh, distribute decision making and um, I'm going to act as a coach, not a, um, a dictator. All of those things are pretty scary um, for a lot of people because I'm not saying all senior leaders are um, terrible people. By, by any means, more that the traditional models of leadership have to change so dramatically that it's a little bit like just being completely at sea. And then a lot of organisations spend a lot of money on agile training for people and hardly anything on leadership coaching um, to, to ch I guess, change the mindset and approach um, of, ha of, of senior leaders. You mentioned as well that these senior leaders, they implement agile at scale frameworks. So they adopt whatever it is. They adopt uh, Scrum with uh, Nexus. They adopt less. They adopt Safe. And they put these in place. But you've, you've compared it to kind of waterfall. So yes, we've taken the approach of planning and then saying, now teams go do. Where do we miss the kind of transformation piece because we can put these structures in place but where do we miss the transformation that allows the organization to perhaps even capitalize on these frameworks and move forward to a truly agile organization yeah i think for me it's really around three things so the first is um falling into the trap of uh setting goals or seeing success as a set of features or deliverables rather than being very clear, um, again, at the senior level, about success being the customer or business outcome that we're trying to affect. And really thinking about those outcomes very carefully, because again, I see a lot of organizations, and we did this at Ovo too, setting the right outcomes, but the, the measures being really, really lagging. And so it's very hard um, uh, to move to go through a, a, an agile transformation if you can't see the immediate impact of the feature or whatever it might be that you're releasing. So I think the first thing is really, really focusing and aligning those those outcomes. And the second is, I think um, I, I mentioned some of these methodologies being akin to waterfall. And what I meant was um, essentially 
what you know, why we think waterfall is less adaptive um, is it takes a, it's a really long planning cycle and then you only find out at the very end whether the customer whether it actually made a difference to the customer and I think some of these methodologies because the feedback loops aren't there um, along the journey it's really hard for the teams to actually adapt which is what agile should be all about um, uh, and so they might be releasing things every two weeks or they might be um, working in smaller uh, increments or um, uh, even if it's kind of uh, PI planning cycles or whatever it might be it's a small increment of work but unless you can unless you can release the smallest possible feature and test it um, uh, with the actual end customer it's really really hard to get that um, uh, the actual what we mean by agility or nimbleness and then the third is a uh, factor I think is around um, trying to uh, remove some of these dependencies. Um, and some of the dependencies are, are even as basic as just having the information. Um, so I'm always amazed uh, looking at, at uh, working with clients with just three things because the platform um, is completely transparent. Everyone can understand the outcomes and the activities of every other team. And I, I say to people, well, what did you do before? How did you stop different teams from um, uh, duplicating work? Or how did you um, uh, how did you ensure that teams could learn from each other um, without kind of senior leadership involved? And typically, um, uh, and, and really effective organisations. So yeah, they are. It's not that they were completely failing until we came along and saved them. Um, uh, yeah, they were they were doing great stuff. But it really is, it, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of governance and a lot of reporting and a lot of um, uh, things that slow you down. Whereas actually having that transparency is one way of just de decoupling some of those dependencies. And then the other dependencies I mentioned, I think, um, probably are more organisational and are really tough for leaders trying to affect uh, an agile transformation to change so centralized procurement centralized hiring budgets by function those types of organizational factors but chipping away at that and i think the best thing that any leader can do um is obviously uh, who wants to make this transformation is obviously um uh, as barry o'reilly would say start small and and prove out the business case prove that small teams who are empowered to actually test and learn and experiment can lead, can deliver better business or customer outcomes and then build from there because changing an entire organizational culture all of the governance structures the leadership attitude um yeah let, let's let's uh, let's eat the elephant very smallly great all right let's let's uh, change it some gears a little bit and uh, move to okrs right so okrs you we've all heard of okrs and uh, in the context of um, the OKR itself, how do you think it actually helps organizations in building transparency, innovation, as well as, uh, you know, the big difference that the organizations want to make, but they typically are, you know, always roadblocked with something or the other, right? So how they are more effective or can be more effective? So I think the first thing I would say is that OKRs are just, it's just a goal methodology. Um, and I think, uh, again, I work with people that, that really uh, want to, I mean, we're all looking for the silver bullet. Um, uh, and I think it's a real mistake to see OKRs as the thing that will will solve some of these issues. Um, they are just a tool um, uh, and they are just one of many goal setting tools. The reason I like OKRs um, so I think that um, uh, structuring um, uh, a objective, which is essentially a uh, an aspirational statement, um, and then having success criteria, key results, allows you to do a couple of things. So first of all, it allows you to um, uh, ensure that everyone understands the why. So why do we want to grow revenue or why do we want to increase website conversion? The objective can be a more aspirational statement and really help to, um, uh, I guess, lift people's eyes a little bit from just a target. And I also like the grouping of uh, metric key results. So for me, key results should always be metric. And that's slightly different from the John Doar um, uh, approach. I really don't believe that key results should be milestones. Um, I think a milestone is typically, if a key result is being set as a milestone, it's typically for me the next level down, which is really the initiatives or features or even projects that you're delivering, that you hypothesize, will change or affect the key result. So 
the one I like about OKR, so aspirational statement is the why, really clear quantita uh, quantitative um, uh, success criteria. And then the fact that you can have a number of key results means that you can try to balance leading and lagging indicators. So again, I think a lot of organizations, um, uh, myself included, I mean, even for my small team at Just Three Things, it's really easy to set lagging metrics. Um, uh, and actually, a key, uh, having a multiple key results allows you to either set some, some leading indicators or to set some guardrails. You know, yes, we want to increase website conversion, but of course, not at any cost, etc. So that I think I like OKRs. The most powerful thing about OKRs and why I think that they are just you, you could supplement them for another goal, um, uh, goal methodology is that they go hand in hand with transparency. And I think transparency is absolutely key. And and if you in getting started on transparency, it doesn't have to be through a tool like just three things. It could be a spreadsheet. It could be you know, the Internet. But having that transparency just allows um, uh, the empower. It means that knowledge isn't power anymore um, or, or should be, or not as much. Um, uh, and it allows teams to um, uh, to learn from each other to say, OK, so we've got this key result. We're all working on these features and initiatives that we think is going to affect this key result. Well, let's let's learn from each other. Let's let's really work together. So it's that the transparency, really thinking about you know, the, the effects of that in terms of aligning, in terms of um, uh, ensuring that constant learning, getting the feedback loops. That, for me, is the true power of OKRs. And that could be achieved through another another goal methodology. I think it's the transparency. It's the outcome measure um, and it's the alignment. Right. So how, how do you think uh, you guys did experiment, obviously, at uh, at OVO, right? Um, maybe you don't have to go into detail, but in a nutshell, like, you know, what was the uh, what was the initial reaction of people? Because a lot of companies, when they try to roll out this this uh, this way of, you know, getting feedback and, you know, getting into the rhythm of getting the objective key results, um, there is a lot of, you know, friction sometimes, sometimes not, but uh, it's it's the understanding and the baselining of, of the expectations and what the outcomes would be, that is that is uh, that is a key. But so, how was the reaction? Or what, what was it like in your over journey? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, typically OKRs are associated with product and tech organizations. So, in our product and tech communities. Um, they were received really well because typically our engineers had worked with them before. Um, uh, it was a normal way of working for them. I think in our other um, uh, functions, slightly tougher um, uh, to, uh, I guess, it, probably the things we, we kind of bumped up against. First of all, the fact that you are um, setting objectives cross-functionally. So, um, so you're trying to align the activities across functions. Um, and that, again, for senior leaders who come in from other organizations, it's it's very natural for people to have their budget set and their goals set by function rather than by customer or business outcome working together. Um, and then I think that the other big kind of mindset change is ensuring that the key results are outcomes. Um, uh, and again, Barry O'Reilly does a great blog on this, but it's very easy to list a, a whole series of outputs. Um, uh, so you deliver this feature, et cetera, deliver this website, whatever it might be, um, without really saying, why are you doing that? Why are you delivering this feature? Um, and so I think the mindset change was having the key results as metric business or customer outcomes, and then the initiative level layer being all the activity that you think going, is going to move that key result, um, but not having a list of deliverables as success criteria. So, Kim, I'd like to go back to kind of the dependencies you mentioned earlier, okay? So we know that some of the frameworks we implement, they try to manage dependencies. Typically, they're within silos, though. So those dependencies within a silo, we can manage. The dependencies that run across silos, so those leaders that we hire in who are used to having their own silo, their own kind of span of control, how is it we can use maybe something like OKRs or some goal-setting mechanism so that we can deliver across those silos, those dependencies, and actually come with a, 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 a successful result at the end and bring true business agility to the organization? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I've seen, I've seen organizations adopt OKRs 
and yet still have all of their governance structures like their management meetings or their um, weekly updates run by function. Um, so I think when thinking about OKRs, again, as I, it's not a silver bullet. It's just it's one tool that you can use um, uh, in a whole in a whole kind of cultural change program. So if you want people to work across um, functions or across uh, the silos, giving them a very, very clear shared outcome um, uh, is absolutely the first step um, uh, without question of a doubt. And OKRs can really achieve that even if the OKR ends up being the objective is shared and then each of the different um, areas has a, owns a key result each, at least they are aligned together in that objective. So the sharing and co-accountability and ownership um, for uh, the outcome, I think is really key. But I also think um, uh, to really reduce silos and break down dependencies, organizations need to think a lot more holistically about the culture that they're building um, and that of course comes from leadership as we've discussed but also it comes from all of the governance and ceremonies that are implicit in the organization um, and even the really small things that might undermine this ability to work cross-functionally um, need to be addressed and and yeah, you know, I would start with how do you run your management meetings? How are updates? Um, if we're still updating by function, then you're never going to get out of that behavior, even if you co-own the outcome. So OVO was born in a, co a regulated industry. So if regulated industries can manage this, other industries certainly can as well. Surely, Mick. <laughs> That's good news for everybody out there then, I think. Kim, thanks very much for joining us today. I think it's been a, it's been a pleasure having you on. Um, Manoy, do you have any last questions for Kim before we finish? Yeah, so Kim, uh, I think it's it's been a great journey for you personally. Uh, but, you know, moving uh, from from one profession to the other one, but actually at least uh, you know looking at the same lens sometimes. I think it's required being a human resources professional. Um, <laughs> I'm always scared of the of the CHRs and. <laughs> <laughs> organization it's kind of a different thing but but at the same time like what, what is a parting of a message you would want to give especially uh you know lived through a journey which was quite rewarding as well as experiential uh for people who are going to start up with a new journey either in transformation or through OKRs uh, so it definitely has been a journey. I don't think I would have thought I would end up running a software company when I was training to be a psychologist um but I think I think the kind of principles of career journeys are the same as principles of organizational transformation. You start small and um, test something out, see if it works, build up momentum and, and, and really get that flywheel going rather than trying to make really big sweeping changes all at once. And um, uh, the smaller the, the starting place, the more likely you are to succeed. Right, perfect. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on. Yep. I believe, we're, I believe we're going to see you in November as well at the Business yeah. Agility Institute conference in Vienna. Absolutely. So we look, forward to, yeah, we look forward to that as well. So we'll see you in November at the latest. Maybe we'll see you earlier as well. Thanks very much for joining us today. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Perfect. Thank Bye. you so much for having me. Thanks.